this is a special edition of Mind Matters. We're at the Minneapolis Convention Center for the National Association for Gifted Children's 65th Annual Conference. The NHGC holds this annual conference so parents, educators, and counselors of gifted kids can come together to share ideas, keep informed about policy changes, understand new data, most anything dealing with giftedness and twice exceptionality, all in an effort to strengthen advocacy for this underserved population. About 2,500 people attend NHGC's conference every year, including people from all 50 states and 38 nations. Today you'll hear from many of them, as well as presenters who are here to share what they know and even the NHGC's top brass. Hello, my name is Renee Yislas and I'm the Executive Director of the National Association for Gifted Children. So what's the vision of NHGC? In 2006, the board of directors actually fleshed out a very uh, focused strategic plan. It refocused our mission, our vision, and our strategic goals. The vision, specifically, helps us think about what we need to see in our country. It says that giftedness must be fully recognized, universally valued, and actively nurtured. Those are three important statements that need to be unpacked a little bit, and they are unpacked in our strategic plan and in the goals later on. How would you describe NAGC's future strategies for moving the cause of giftedness forward? Well, it it also goes back to our mission. Our mission statement is that we're going to support educators who are helping gifted children reach for their personal best by providing a couple different things. Education, that happens at the conference. Uh, Advocacy, we have several advocacy sessions and are trying to organize leaders to uh, pursue this cause and move this cause forward. We have community building, which is a big aspect of the convention. And then fourthly, it's research. So you can see the convention really embodies all elements of NAGC's mission. We see ourselves as uh, advancing and organizing just that. It's a movement. It's not just a conference anymore. It's not just a membership association. It's actually a group of people that are trying to create a social change so that things are, that giftedness and and, uh, high potential are universally valued, fully recognized and actively nurtured. That doesn't go on in the country yet. And so what I see three, five years is more uh, and more growth in terms of the numbers of people that are going to be advancing this cause and real tangible changes at the state, uh, local level, and at the federal level. We're already seeing that starting to happen. So the three strategies that we have uh, pursued are changing minds, changing policies, and changing practices. And so when we talk about changing minds, we're really trying to increase the public's urgency to support gifted and talented children. And you can see across the nation how it's growing. Um, In the Washington Post, in the Wall Street Journal, in the Seattle Times, all of these major media outlets are now starting to cover this issue. And we're helping people understand that gifted children have needs and they need to be supported and just how many there really are that are not getting what they need in their classrooms today. Thanks, Renee. I really appreciate the opportunity to communicate about the nature and needs of gifted children and the service that you're providing to people out there and supporting the movement. Every morning in hotel lobbies and the main hall of the conference center, attendees begin assembling early. The first learning sessions start at 8 a.m. In Minneapolis, there's an enclosed skyway that connects most of the area hotels with the conference center, so attendees can mostly stay out of the weather. NAGC's opening keynote address was Dr. Michelle Borba, and she talked about the importance of empathy. She was a guest on Mind Matters in June. One of the most amazing experiences was working with a child who was 16 years of age, one of those that many of them the school had given up on, wanted to expel him because he was always bullying. And thank God for one teacher who said, no, we're not going to expel him because we will lose him. What were we going to do, said the principal. I'm going to help him become best friends with the kindergartner. Now, this was one of those wonderful opportunities that 
The high school kids got out a little bit earlier. The kindergarten was the second session and was there a little later. And so every day after school, that 16-year-old was to bond with Noah and help him. Did it help at the beginning? Absolutely not. But the teacher did something else that parents and teachers can do. And that is she sat down with the older child and she said, how will you know if Noah's happy? How will you know if he's not enjoying this? How will you know that it's time to stop? She helped him learn emotional literacy. She helped him learn how to encourage a child. She began to help him learn all of the skills that this child never had. And it took almost three weeks. But I will tell you one of the most priceless photos I have that's sitting here on my desk right now, the kindergarten teacher took. And that was the day that you saw a bond, a relationship that opened up between Noah and that 16-year-old teen. You saw a face-to-face connection. But what you saw is, yes, a happy Noah, but you saw a child, a teen, who now realized he was a caring person. Every year, professionals in various fields come to the conference to give presentations and appear on panels. The speakers are chosen based on their areas of expertise and are scheduled so an attendee can hopefully take in a variety of info. Teachers can find what they're looking for, but so can parents and mental health professionals, school administrators, and so on. I'm Chris Amspa, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Virginia. So what did you cover in your presentation today? So, you know, I go back to the ideas about social constructivism and why we bother to have kids work in groups at all. Um, and part of that is because we know social and social learning is, in fact, really important, and it's a great way to help kids make meaning of new content, new ideas, new experiences. Um, and through the social learning, students develop all sorts of networks. Um, sometimes they use technology, sometimes they do it face-to-face, um, but all of this helps them create meaning and understanding. Um, and when we go to our theories, then, about social learning, Um, and social constructivism, we know there are a few different parts that kind of have to be in play. And one of those is the idea of the zone of proximal development. So um, the notion that students are given access and the ability to play with content that's kind of right in that area that will stretch them a little bit. Um, And that we know is not gonna be the same for all students in a classroom at all times. Um, We also know that social constructivism depends on having some conversations and relationships with a more knowledgeable other. So the idea that um, our gifted student isn't always the person who is the more knowledgeable other, but that they also need opportunities to interact with people from whom they can learn in addition to helping others learn. Um, Then we know the social interaction itself is very important. Um, And for some of our gifted learners, kind of learning how to suffer the fool and how to behave appropriately when you're in a group of people that have different background experiences than you um, certainly is a value of group work, but again, is not the only purpose for it. Christina, thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) One pretty important subject being discussed this year is the move from national to local norms when identifying gifted kids. I'm Scott Peters. I'm a faculty member at UW-Whitewater and also the uh, association editor of NAGC. So, can you describe local norms and why they're important? Sure. So there's, there's two reasons to, to like local norms or to, to want to do them or why you should do them. The, the first has to deal with equity and the second just has to do with kind of the logic of programming. And so we've got some pretty compelling research now that local norms drastically increase the racial, ethnic, socioeconomic representation of students in your programs. So the numbers I, have, I talk about and we just have from our recent research is anywhere from a 170% increase to a 300% increase in the representation of African Americans and Latino and Latina students under local norms. And that means if you identify students as, say, the top 10% of your building instead of the top 10% of the nation. So just doing that and nothing else drastically increases your racial ethnic proportionality. That's number one. Like that's, that's a good thing, but it's not the only good thing. The other reason to like them is that they align much more with the purpose of having gifted ed. So the purpose of having gifted ed is to meet student needs, to provide them with a service that they're not currently receiving, you know, because they're under-challenged or whatever. And national norms just don't do that. Because you can have kids that are identified under national norms who are doing just fine. You can also have kids that aren't identified under national norms because they're below grade level who are under-challenged because of what the school is focusing on. So a local norm does a better job of actually zeroing in on who is the most likely to need something else in my school right here, right now? And that's really the question that matters. And that, that, in my argument, is why local norms are good. 
how would you convince someone who's a little skeptical that local norms are important? So there's, there's a couple of different big concerns that come up frequently. One has to do with portability. So wait a minute, if my kid gets identified at this building but then moves to a different building, is she not going to be identified anymore? And you, you, you kind of have to change the question a little bit and say, okay, it's not that we're going to de-identify them, but they might not need a special intervention beyond the regular classroom anymore, ideally because they're receiving it as part of the regular curriculum. So you go from kind of a lower performing school where you need a gifted intervention to be challenged, you move to a different building that's higher performing, and they've got that service for you. You don't need a gifted service. You're fine with what they have. So hopefully that's not a problem, but that's often a concern about portability. The same thing comes up when kids go to middle school. It's a different context now, what's going to happen. And yes, you do have to re-identify, and maybe you have some kids who aren't in need of an advanced service anymore when they go in. So that's, that's totally feasible, reasonable. The other thing that comes up a lot is there's concerns about how it's often sold is watering down, that by doing that, we're identifying students with a lower level of readiness. And that's absolutely true. That, that absolutely can and frequently does happen. But that's kind of the point. We have kids who aren't being identified with our current criteria. We're using slightly different criteria, which means we're getting more students. And yes, those students will have a wider range of needs. So the, the one little catchphrase I always say is if you're going to differentiate identification, you have to differentiate services. So people have concerns about, oh, well, I've got these kids now that need something else. You know, they don't need the program I currently have. Yes, that's true. It's an argument for needing to expand your services. So it's not for free. You do have the burden of needing to expand and kind of maybe broaden the services that you're offering when you implement those local norms. And for some people, that's a deal breaker. They just, they're not in a position where they can offer that. I, mean, I don't like that, but I understand that that's a, a challenge. So can a school district get started using local norms without spending money on retesting their students? Or will it usually cost money to move to local norms? Nope. So local norms applies regardless of what your definition or operationalized definition is of gifted. So it doesn't matter if you think that's high achieving in math, if you think it's high on a nonverbal ability test, it doesn't matter. Whatever the process is to identify gifted students in your school or your district, you can apply local norms to that. So you can absolutely use tests you still have, presuming those are well aligned to the services. So if you have a math test and your programs are all in verbal areas, obviously you probably don't want to continue with that method. But assuming you've got data on hand from having done 10 years of traditional gifted identification using national norms, all it takes is you and your computer, and you can pretty easily do local norms. You don't need to do a special kind of test or you know, purchase a special product for it. Yep, you can abs And something we're actually working on is an online app where you can just upload your data, and it'll be norm ranked for you um, so that people don't have to relearn this whole thing. That's something Matt McBee and I are working on that we thought might be helpful. So where can people go to get in touch with you or at least learn more about local norms? Yeah, the best place to go is um, so my faculty website, which is go go.uww.edu and then it's forward slash peters s so go.uww.edu slash peters s p-e-t-e-r-s-s -S -S. it's as short as i could get it <laughs> and that'll take you to my faculty page and one of the reasons i have that is because everything i write even if it's behind a paywall a free version of it goes on that website so you can access every single article you don't have to pay for it is on there i also have a link called gifted identification resources um, on there, and that's a separate page that has some of those online apps that we've developed, and that's where we will be putting the um, the later apps as we develop them. So we've got like three or four right now. We're going to be adding another one soon, and, that, and that's that's where we'll be linking to. It. Thanks, Scott. My pleasure. I hope it helps people. In the lobby of our hotel, we ran into a couple of authors conspiring on a new book. I'm Joy Lawson Davis, and I'm Deb Douglas. And you seem to be in a pretty deep conversation. We are. We, we have are. a new project we're very excited about. Very, very excited about it. Deb's book on self-advocacy for gifted learners kind of led us to a place where we realized that there had to be something. Uh, Deb wanted to include one chapter about special populations. Uh, but then she realized one chapter wasn't going to do it. So then we, we talked together about putting together an entire book around self-advocacy strategies, tips, for students in special population groups. We wanted um, to look at the barriers that each of those groups might face in trying to self-advocate and then help educators figure out um, ways in which they can, strategies as you said, are support to help students uh, move beyond those barriers. And so our, our working title is No More Dreams Deferred from Langston Hughes. 
So this event is not just a chance for the two of you to share your knowledge with attendees, but also you get a chance to collaborate because you don't live anywhere near each other, do you? No, we're not. I'm in Virginia and Deb is... I'm in Wisconsin. <laughs> and although we can email and text, we um, Joy has such a busy life. We're both running in different directions all the time. So this is fun to be to in the sit same... Down and breathe the same air. Exactly. And, <laughs> and you know, kind of work through some of the, the bumps that we've already come into. You know, we've had some, some issues and concerns about about what, which of the chapters are, which, which special pop groups are the most, you know, the ones that we want to kind of target. Um, how do we make sure that, that the student's voice is so important to this piece, that the student's voice is heard? And uh, because this is about their dreams. It's not our dreams, it's not the scholars' dreams, it's the students' dreams. And so we wanted to make sure, and we're on the same page with that, but we're kind of guiding uh, the authors in that same direction. Mm -hmm. We have a, quite a roster of wonderful experts on each of the populations that are, we won't reveal names no, now, but we can't we're, do that yet. we're very excited about the people working with us. And so we'll be editing it, the contributions of um, several key players in mm -hmm. each of those populations. Mm -hmm. Thanks for letting us bug you for a minute. Thank Thanks you. for Thank giving you us so a much. chance to talk yeah. about it. Appreciate so you. Cool. Okay. Here's someone who knows a lot about twice exceptionality. My name is Megan Foley Nickpon, and I'm a professor at the University of Iowa in counseling psychology. And I'm associate director for research and clinic at the Bell and Blake Center. So, what are you talking about at the conference this year? So, I'm involved in four different presentations, and they all have to do with twice exceptionality, which has been what I've done for the almost 15 years that I've been with the Bell and Blake Center. So, I'm a trained psychologist, so I look at twice exceptionality from a psychological standpoint. I'm not a gifted education specialist. So overall, how do we identify twice exceptional children best? What are best practices? And then also what intervention strategies would be effective with this population? So what do you think about this year's event? Oh, it's been great. And there are a lot of twice exceptional presentations and a lot of new and exciting ideas and new people who are talking about twice exceptionality. So that's what I always say that there aren't enough of us and I feel that that is, is different now, and so it's really great to see. You're with the Bell and Blank Center, which has been really expanding its services and growing a lot. The website is bellandblank.org. Yeah, check out our website to find out more about us. Megan, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Around the middle of the day, you'll find people searching out food or finding a quiet corner to check messages and respond to emails. It's pretty much your average conference in that respect, but then it's back into sessions. By the time the day is over, around 10 hours later, each attendee has had the chance to choose from well over 150 different sessions and presentations, roundtables and forums, and that's just one day. In one of those presentation rooms, you'll find... I'm Emily Mofield, and I work at Lipscomb University. I'm new there, I just started in August. And I've done this work with my colleague who's also there, Megan Parker-Peters. So what subject are you covering in your session? Okay, so um, our presentation was on teaching tenacity and resilience. And so there's a lot that's been said about you know, growth mindset and, and persevering, but um, the big emphasis that, we're, that we presented on was how emotions play a role in that tenacity and that pers perseverance. Thanks, have fun. One of the sessions was Conversation in Color. It was a chance for attendees to sit around tables with other attendees and color and unwind. Mind Matters executive producer Dave Morris talked to some of those in attendance. If that name sounds familiar, yeah, he's my husband. Who are you? My name's Sarah Bittner, and I'm the TALS Teaching and Learning Specialist for grades K through 5 for the Noka Hennepin Schools District 11. How long have you been coming to these kinds of conferences? Well, this is my first NAGC conference. I've been to other conferences for Gifted Ed, but this is my first one, and I'm really excited because it's in my backyard, and I'd be able to attend with 10 of my teachers. Oh, yeah? What is your connection to giftedness? Well, when I started teaching in the late 80s, I was working in St. Paul at the Gifted Magnet, and I always found a real love for teaching those stu students. I taught third and fifth grade, 
as a homeroom teacher, and so I think that's what spurred my interest in gifted ed. And from there, I always kind of been, have had my pulse on it, um, have a degree in it, and so then I really wanted to take that into my own children's learning and then continue on. And so now I am in Anoka Hennepin, and I'm able to really work with the teachers that directly instruct our students in that district. What is the biggest obstacle facing gifted kids today? Well, it's hard to pinpoint one. I think I think all districts are trying to really do their very best. I think in some districts they're financially not able to um, always meet the needs of the students within their district dependent on budget cuts or levies not passing. But I also think there's an emotional component with our gifted ed population that a lot of kids are struggling, but maybe our gifted population more so, you know, feeling confident in who they are and the beliefs that um, the skills and talents that they have, how are they going to use them? And sometimes there's a real emotional, social acceptance of those students. So I think that compassion really needs to be a a forefront in how we look at that population of students and the, and the special needs that they have, besides just the academic. Can you tell me what value you get out of the NAGC conference? What I love the most is I see everybody really engaged. They're really dedicated to this profession of this area of education. Even parents will be here too and families, but professors and all the different programs that really cater to that and so it brings it all all of us together and we have a common goal to meet the needs of these students that we're so dedicated to providing the best educational opportunities for them. I'm just really feel honored that I can be a part of it. I'm Michelle Partridge and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. What brings you to Minneapolis? I'm actually a gifted teacher at Benteen Elementary in Atlanta but I am one of this year's Javits Fraser Scholars so that's how we ended up here. What are you the most passionate about? One of the things that I'm kind of really passionate about, and one of the things that brought me here is um, my interest in sort of access and equity in gifted education. And I teach at a, um, a basically minority school, 100% free and reduced lunch. And it's interesting to see the lack of identified students, uh, gifted identified students in the school versus the students who are actually gifted in the school. You know, the students who I can see that light in and they're not being recognized and they're not being noticed because of those things that are usually seen as deficiencies by outsiders. So what do you do to fix that? I do a lot of talent development. You know, we have a, a pretty low number of students who are actually currently gifted identified. So I do a lot of talent development. I go into those K-1 and 2 classrooms and play games with them and do sort of creativity activities with them and it's really cool and I love having conversations with teachers afterwards about hey have you looked at this kid like they've got some real insight and a lot of times the teacher is more worried about well they're not reading on grade level and I was like but look at their critical thinking and I just I just want everybody to have the ability to really see that in their students despite those other things that they're bringing to the table. What do you get personally from uh, conferences like this? Um, for me, it gives me a lot of tools for my toolbox, as they say. A lot of things that I can do to sort of develop that creativity or that critical thinking in students. Um, it gives me an opportunity to network and sort of meet people and shamelessly steal ideas from them. It's a utilize in my classroom to really sort of ignite passion in the students or even in the teachers. So our opening speaker, I teared up a little bit <laughs> several times because the stories were amazing and it made me think of students that I've had in the past. Um, I met earlier with uh, Sally Crisell, the president, and she one of the first things she said was, think of the most gifted minority student you've taught and why weren't they gifted identified? And I was like, oh, well, he could do the Fibonacci sequence in his head in kindergarten but he could barely write his name on a piece of paper. And I was like, but that kid was so gifted. You know, like I couldn't keep up with him mathematically. Hi, I'm Tamara McConnell. I am from I. Schultmartz Elementary School, Magnet School of Math, Science, and Technology. And we are part of the Mobile County Public School System. What do you think the biggest challenges are for us, uh, the gifted community right now? I think a lot of the challenges are have been eternal which is that uh, people have a misunderstanding 
of our programming. They feel it's elitist. Uh, the funding sometimes is not there. So a lot of our mission needs to be helping people to understand what we do and the needs of the students we serve. Because it's difficult to be eight years old, to have the intellect of a college student, and be eight years old emotionally. It doesn't fit. The asynchronicity is a huge thing our children struggle with. Okay, so my name is Ashley Mabry. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and my title is Youth and Family Support Mentor with the New York Edge. It's formerly known as Sports and Arts and Schools Foundation. So I am a part of a pilot program. Um, it's within an after-school setting, and we actually identified 30 students who are top-ranking in a school of undersourced um, under-resourced students and so we actually wanted to do something a little different and see what we can do if we provide these students with resources you know just try it out see what happens what success we can get from it and is it working yeah and I'm telling you we have a wonderful group of kids um, I mean I don't know how they would perform on a gifted and talented test but if you were to have a conversation with these students phenomenal phenomenal. What is it that presents the biggest challenges to gifted students today? Um, I can only speak for the students I work with and I think it's being given opportunities. Um, a lot of these students are ignored. Um, they're often seen as the students who have behavior issues um, or maybe the lazy students in class. They're not performing because they feel like they don't want to be seen as smart enough or they don't want to be uh, teased. I've had a lot of students say that sometimes they're teased because they're nerds, so they'll downplay how smart they are. Um, and I think at this point, I'm just really trying to get them to embrace that part of them because they have something really great to offer. All right, so Susan Hawk and a rural district in and near the Treasure Valley in Idaho. What got you into gifted education? I was introduced to this idea last year, and I jumped at the chance because I love science and technology, engineering, the math, and robotics. The gifted and talented with, that I'm working with um, were, a lot of them are self-identified as well as teacher-identified, um, and we are trying to increase our scope of students within our district. That was one of those things that I want to be able to really increase um, is identifying students that are gifted and talented in alternate areas. What do you get personally from a conference like this? It's the new ideas and the application of those ideas in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, big, big, from big, big, big picture, truly, you know, 10,000 feet big picture down to the 5,000 foot picture, down to the mile picture, down to that 100 foot, and then the intimate day-to-day. -day. Um, there's so many different levels and that I get to be able to take away from um, that inclusion where I get to see different people um, sharing their knowledge, their uh, expertise in so many different areas. And that's what I really like about these conferences. My name's Tiffany Cogby, and I'm a gifted, talented teacher for K-5, but uh, I serve identified gifted, talented kids in 3-5 mainly. What got you into gifted education? I am a parent of the gifted and um, I think it was my frustration really with uh, some of the things I was seeing that were lacking in my, my own kids' educational experience. Um, the teachers are wonderful and they're kind and, and, and caring and considerate, but I don't think a lot of teachers have, and I didn't either as a teacher, so I, I, I mean, I know where they're coming from as well, but I think that t mainstream teachers of a traditional classroom don't understand the struggles that gifted children face every day. So 
Yeah. So that was the passion to kind of change things up a little bit. How many of these conferences have you been to? This is my first time attending the NAGC conference, and I'm just so excited to be learning new and cutting edge techniques and, and, and research that's coming out in the field of gifted, talented education. I, I want to take that back and not only help, but help my students grow from what I'm learning with this, with this conference, but also my own kids. When it's time to leave Minneapolis and head home to wherever home is, attendees are tired, but they're reinvigorated by what they've learned. Some of it they already knew, but it's good to have that refresher and maybe a new perspective. Maybe, even more importantly, they got to see their tribe. Fellow teachers, counselors, administrators, psychologists, therapists, parents. And to be reminded that they're all in it together. They have new connections. They found new resources. They reorganized their toolbox. And they met people who reminded them that, while everyone has their own stories, they all have a similar ring to them. We're not so different. Some of the key takeaways for us were as follows, in no particular order. Coaches always coach up, but teachers don't always teach up. Why is that? Look at the color of each other's eyes. Smile. And that's how we bring back civilization. Every student who puts a year into school should get a year out. Inch by inch, life's a cinch. Yard by yard, life is hard. And empathy is a verb. Another year of our podcast is ahead in 2019. We'll have exciting guests and helpful information for gifted people and those who love them. So look for us in January. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. Dave and I will see you then on Mind Matters. There's a hole in the gray sky where the sun comes through. Baby, can't you see the patch of blue? There's a silver lining if you care to see that things aren't as dark as they sometimes seem to be. Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.